Ustaz Numan Ali Khan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawmid din. Allahumma aj'alna minhum wa min alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sabr. Amin ya rabbil alamin. Thumma amma ba'd fa a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim yusabbihu lillahi ma fi al-samawati wa ma fi al-ard al-maliki al-quddus al-aziz al-hakim. هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين وآخرين منهم لما يلحقوا بهم وهو العزيز الحكيم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم رب الشح لصدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر واللهم بلغنا رمضان يا أرحم الراحمين. Today, إن شاء الله تعالى, as it was announced, is my last lecture uh, before I head back home. إن شاء الله تعالى tomorrow, and I was asked to give a talk about the preparation for Ramadan. And in all honesty, I've been thinking a lot about how to prepare myself and my family and friends for the month of Ramadan. You all know that when the month of Ramadan gets closer and closer, our ulama and the du'at, they remind us of the ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah talks about Ramadan. Shahru Ramadan al-lazhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. And many of you might expect that today also I will be talking to you about these ayat, but actually that's not what I'm going to do. I will only make an introductory comment about those ayat, and the rest of the time I'll talk to you about another place altogether. I'll be talking to you about the beginning of Surah Al-Jumu'ah. That's what my subject matter today is, the beginning of Surah Al-Jumu'ah. But before I do that, I do want to share something with you about Ramadan from the ayah, Shahru Ramadan al-lazhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jalla talks about Ramadan only once. It only once in the entire Qur'an does Allah talk about the month of Ramadan. And for Muslims all over the world, when we think of Ramadan, the first thing we think about is fasting. The first thought that comes in my head, as we think of tonight, we're go- tomorrow night we're going to pray taraweeh, that means the day after that is going to be a very long day. And I'm going to be very hungry and thirsty. So we start thinking about food and drink immediately. But it's incredible that in the Qur'an, when Allah introduced us to the month of Ramadan, He did not introduce the month of Ramadan with fasting. He did not introduce us to this month with psalm. He said, Shahru Ramadan, الَّذِي unzila fihi Al-Qur'an The month of Ramadan is in fact the one in which the Qur'an was sent down. In other words, the first thing you and I have to think about when we think of Ramadan is the Qur'an. We Muslims, the ones who are knowledgeable and the ones who are not knowledgeable, the ulama and the, uh, the, the common people among the Muslims, all of us know that Ramadan is a time to get closer to Allah. All of us know Ramadan is a time to make extra dua. All of us know Ramadan is a time to give up a lot of sins, to make istighfar. To go to the masjid more than usual. A lot of people who normally don't go to the masjid, they start coming to the masjid in the month of Ramadan. So even if you don't know a lot about Islam, you still know that this month you have to do a little extra for Allah. Every Muslim feels this. But it's incredible that in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal gave us the key. The key on how to get close to Him in this month. And that key is the Quran itself. It is the book of Allah. So if you really, really want to get close to Allah in Ramadan, if you really want to fulfill the purpose of Ramadan for yourself and I for myself, then the month of Ramadan has to be about the Qur'an. It has to be about the Qur'an for you and for me. 
And we have to treat it as though we've never had a relationship with the Qur'an before. You're starting all over again. You're starting all over again. You know, even though I'm not going to talk to you in detail about those ayat of Al-Baqarah, it's incredible that it's a Madani Surah. Which means the Muslims have been Muslim for a long time. The Sahaba have been Muslim for a long time. And they know about the Qur'an, and they know about the Akhirah, and they know about these things. Yet in the ayah of Al-Baqarah, when Allah introduced us to Ramadan, He decided also to introduce us to the Qur'an. Listen to me again. He did not just introduce us to Ramadan, He also introduced us to the Qur'an. He said, Hudallin nas wa bayinatim min al huda wal furqan. It is guidance for people. The Quran is guidance for people. You tell me, did the Muslims already know that it is guidance for people? Did we already know that when the ayah came down? We did. We had known then since, since somebody said shahada, they knew that the Quran is guidance for humanity. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal in the month of Ramadan, when He introduced us to the Quran, said almost as though you have to start all over again. So you and I have to start reading the Quran and studying the Quran and reflecting and thinking about the Quran in this month like we have never read it before, like it's the first time. Like it's the first time. And that's beautiful because you know what? If we did fulfill the rights of Ramadan, if we did uh, you know, fulfill what Allah expects from us in Ramadan, غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِهِ the, the promise of Rasulullah wasallam that all of your previous sins are forgiven. You get a new start. Just like you get a new start in your life in Ramadan, you and I are supposed to get a new start with the Qur'an. So this session, that I want to have with you today is actually about the Qur'an itself. And one of the most beautiful places that describe my relationship and your relationship with the Qur'an. And I chose this passage, you will see by the end, why I chose these ayat. Because ever since I landed in Malaysia, I've been thinking about these ayat. There's one particular ayah, I can't stop thinking about it. I'll get to that later. It just, it just keeps spinning in my head every time, every time. And so I want to share that with you by the end of today's talk. Allah Azza wa Jal revealed in Surah, uh, surah Al-Jumu'ah three parts. The first part, Allah talks about the believers. He talks about His Messenger and He talks about the believers. The second part, He talks about Bani Israel. He talks about the Jews. And the third part, He talks about the Friday prayer. He talks about the Friday prayer. So there are three parts to Surah Al-Jumu'ah. It's very short and it happens very quickly. The first part is about us. It's addressing us directly. And it begins with Allah and His Messenger wasallam, and about the Ummah. Then He talks about Bani Israel. And then He talks about what? What did I say? What was the third part? The Friday prayer. Three parts. And hopefully even though I will not be giving you a lecture about the entire Surah, at the very least, I'll share with you how these three things are connected. Because Surah Al-Jumu'ah is one message. It's one khutbah from Allah. If you recite Surah Al-Jumu'ah, it takes five minutes or less. You're done. In this short speech, how come there are three different parts? They must all be connected. There must be one message. And so, but today is just the first message. My focus is just on that first part. So we begin. This is a Madani Surah. Which means this surah came down after the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moved to Medina. And in Medina, the Muslims are of three categories. They are the strongest Muslims, the mu'minun. There are Muslims who are new to Islam. They're not very strong yet. And their iman hasn't been tested yet. They're the Muslims. We can call them Muslim. So there's the mu'min and there's the Muslim. And then there are those who came into Islam, but they don't have good intentions. Or they, have strong, they don't have strong will. So when the test comes from Allah, they fail the test. They fail the test. And these are the munafiqoon, may Allah not make us from them. So there's the Muslim, there's the mu'min, and there's also the munafiq. There are, all three of them are in Medina. All three of these categories are in Medina. But in Makkah, when Rasul was in Makkah, then actually the level of iman and the level of conviction in Mecca was very high. 
So the overall level of Iman of the Muslims was, was much higher in Mecca and it's now starting to come down in Medina because it's not only the highest believers, as sabiqoon as sabiqoon ulaika al muqarrabun it's not only them. There are some new people too who haven't gotten the kind of training that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq has radiallahu anhu or like Umar radiallahu anhu, there are some new people. And also there are people who are munafiqoon. So overall, the concentration has gotten low. The iman is not as strong. And in that climate, when Allah Azza wa Jal teaches the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the iman is going down of the ummah, He revealed certain surahs that are supposed to raise the iman again. These surahs are called the musabbihat. They begin with sabbaha lillah or yusabbihu lillah. The purpose of these surahs in Madani Qur'an is to raise the iman of the ummah. And Surah Al-Jumu'ah is one of these surahs. Allah Azza wa Jal begins, يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Everything in the skies and the earth continues to and will continue to declare Allah's perfection. Everything in the skies and the earth is doing tasbih. يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Before I go on, I want you to think about this concept. Everything is doing tasbih. This piece of plastic I have on my face over here is doing tasbih. The fan over there is doing tasbih. The light bulb is doing tasbih. The concrete on the floor is doing tasbih. The chair you're sitting on is doing tasbih. That is what Allah is saying. The star is doing tasbih. The, the insects are doing tasbih. Thank you. This is doing tasbih. <laughs> okay? Now listen, why is that important? Because Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, nobody should come to remind you to do tasbih. Everything around you is reminding you to do tasbih. Sometimes you make salah, and you finish salah, and you're in a hurry. So you finish salah, and you get up and you go. But sometimes you finish salah, and the person next to you is doing tasbih. And when you see that person doing tasbih, what do you do? He said, oh, I forgot, man, I should do the sabiyah too. You see, when you see someone else doing it, what happens? You remember yourself. You remember yourself. He's yours. Is that, that interesting? I'll tell you something about lectures. I know I'm stopping in the middle of a lecture, but this is important. There are a lot of you here, and there's only one of me. So when somebody walks by for some reason, a lot of people say, And it becomes so interesting. And when you become so interested, I become interested. So this person's walking by and I start looking at him too like, what's, is he going to do a circus trick or is he going to, you know, what's he going to do? <laughs> so don't get distracted, it's not going to be that. By the way, this is only interesting if you're listening to a lecture. After the lecture is done, there will be a thousand people walking by, but you won't look at them. But if you're sitting in a lecture, everything other than the lecture becomes interesting. You will look up at the fan. Wow. <laughs> everything else except the lecture. So, <laughs> I know it's hard. But try to concentrate. Everything is doing what? This me. And one of the benefits of that is that now I am constantly being reminded by all the creations of Allah that I should be doing tasbih also. This is, every ayah is to benefit me. That's one of the benefits of the ayah. Everything does tasbih, why don't you? يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ الْمَلِكِ الْقُدُّوسِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ This is unusual in the Qur'an. Allah usually mentions two of His names at the end of an ayah. وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ But here you find four names of Allah in a row. الملك, القدوس, العزيز, الحكيم. Four names of Allah. The first name is الملك, which means the king. The second name is Al-Quddus, which means the ultimately pure. Not only the one who is pure, Quddus is also the one who purifies. So there are two meanings, the Lazim and the Muta'addi meaning. The one who is pure and the one who purifies. That is the Quddus. I'm giving you simple meanings. What was Al-Malik? Call it out loud. What was Al-Malik? 
the king. What is Al-Quddus? The pure. The pure and the purifier. The pure and the purifier. Okay, that's Al-Quddus. Then it's Al-Aziz. Al-Aziz is the authority. Someone who has Izzah has two things by the way. Izzah has two things in it. Izzah has respect and Izzah has authority. I'll say that again. Izzah has respect and Izzah has authority. So someone who is Aziz is respected and they also have authority. Now you know these two things, they're not always together. Sometimes people have authority but they have no respect. Sometimes a government or a police officer has authority but people still don't respect him. They listen to him because they're scared of him. But they don't listen to him because they respect him. You understand? So you can have authority without respect. It's possible. You can also have respect without authority. It could be an old lady that's crossing the street. We respect her because she's older, but she may not have any what? No authority. So you have respect and authority are two different things. But when you call someone Al-Aziz, then you respect them and they have authority. And by extension, you respect their authority. This is Al-Aziz. So there was Al-Malik, which was? The king. Al-Quddus, the pure. Al-Aziz, the one who gets respect and has authority. The, okay, now Al-Aziz, what's the last name? Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim. Al-Hakim is the wise. Al-Hakim is the one who has wisdom. There are four names of Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in this ayah. And as I continue this brief, brief dars, I want you to try to remember these four names. I'll say them out loud again. Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim. Now we go to the second ayah. The first ayah, by the way, it's beautiful. The first ayah was about Allah. Everything, the tasbih of Allah, the King, the, the pure, the authority, the wise. That's the first ayah. The second ayah is about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one ayah about Allah and the, one, the other ayah about His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can think of it as the first ayah is like La ilaha illallah and the second ayah is like Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's very beautiful. They go hand in hand. هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ He is the one who appointed, who raised among the Ummiyin. Ummi is someone who is as unaware of writing as they were when they came out of their mother. Umm means mother. Ummi is someone who is basically did, did not receive an education just like a baby does not receive an education. When a baby is a newborn, they don't get an education. They can't learn how to read and write. So by extension, the people who did not know how to read and write, they were called Ummiyun. They were called Ummiyun. Now Allah says, He is the one who raised among the Ummiyin. Ba'atha fil Ummiyin. Within the Ummiyin. Rasulam minhum. A messenger from among themselves. Allah sent among, within them a messenger from among themselves. A couple of things for you to think about. First of all, Allah is telling us subhanahu wa ta'ala that He raised His Messenger from among people who don't know how to read and write. He is from within them, fil ummiyin. Not even minal ummiyin, it is fil ummiyin. He is from within them. And in saying so, Allah Azza wa Jal has given honor to people who even don't have an education. You know in, in, in society nowadays, we think of respecting someone, we first ask, what kind of degree do you have? What kind of degree you got? Before we think about showing you some respect. By the way, we'll talk about the Jews in a little bit in the surah, but the Jews used to make fun of the Arabs, the mushrikun of Mecca. And one of the reasons they made fun of them because they didn't know how to read and write. Now Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us that He can pick the greatest teacher of all human beings, the most knowledgeable human being in human history, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is actually picked from within the Ummiyin. From within the Ummiyin. Which means He honored those people even. He honored those people. He selected those people. It is an honor that Allah gave to the Arabs and even to the Ummiyin. And from it, one of the lessons that we have to learn is everybody deserves respect. Everyone deserves respect. 
He sent a messenger from among them. Now you have to think about something about the word messenger. We use the word messenger all the time. We don't think about it. A messenger is someone who has a message. If, you're, if I live in the house, and my children live in the house, and nobody goes outside, then the people who live in my house, they don't have a new message for me. Because to get a new message, you have to go outside. You have to go somewhere else, and then you get a message. If my, if my son says to me, Abba, I have a message for you. What's the, where'd you get the message? Did you go outside? No. Did somebody call you? No. No, I just have a message for you. It doesn't make any sense. You cannot have a message for me until you go somewhere outside. Allah says He was among them and He has a message for them. By the way, if you want to receive a message and then deliver a message, you could probably best, it's best to pick someone who knows how to write it down and then say it to somebody so the message is given accurately. But Allah Azza wa Jal already called him an Nabi al Ummi, fil Ummiyin. He's already an Ummi. How strange it is that he's a messenger and he's from among them. They were expecting a messenger from the outside. He's from among them. Rasulam minhum. And what is he doing among them? Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. Here's where the, in, the, the very strange word, wording begins. Something for you and me to think about. Allah Azza wa Jal says, He reads onto them His ayat. Tala yatlu. You know, when I'm, I have the mushaf in front of me, when my eyes follow the words, when my eyes literally follow, Yusabbihu lillahi ma fis samawati, my finger is moving and my eyes are moving. This following is called tilawa. When your eyes and your finger follow, that is called tilawa. In other words, tilawa is done when you're not saying something yourself, something is dictating it to you. In this case, the page is telling me what to read and I am following. These are not my words, these are the words on the page. You understand? Now again, something for you seriously to think about. You, I know how my children speak. You know how your children speak. You know how your wife speaks and your husband speaks. You know how your parents speak. But your wife comes to you, or better yet, your husband comes to you, and he starts talking like Shakespeare. <laughs> and he recites a poem from Shakespeare. Now you don't know Shakespeare, but you know your husband, and you know he's not Shakespeare. <laughs> so when he recites a poem like Shakespeare, can you tell that those are not his words? Can you tell? They're coming out of his mouth. And he says to you, listen, I want to tell you something. And he starts reciting some poetry from Shakespeare. And what's the first question you ask? First you ask, what is wrong with you? <laughs> or what do you want? But after that, where did, you, where did you get this from? Where did you learn this from? He says, no, 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 these are my own words. I just said it from my heart. <laughs> do you believe that? And what is the proof? This is the thing to think about. What is the proof? that these are not his words. You know for a fact, these are not his words because you know how he talks. You know the limits of his vocabulary. You know the limits of his English, you understand? And everybody has a speech pattern. If my child memorized a page from a science book and came up to me and told me, but you know, let me tell you something about gravity. And he starts talk, reciting a page from his science textbook. Will I know that those are not his words? That he is following something else? You understand? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been among the ummiyeen his whole life. That's why Allah said, fil ummiyeen. And he is not from the outside, he is from within them. Which is why Allah said, minhum. Yes? And if he's from within them, do they know how he speaks? Does his uncle, his wife, his friends, do they know how he speaks? When he starts speaking the Qur'an, immediately, immediately they know that's not his words. That's now how anybody speaks. He's following something else. He's following, you understand? He's doing tilawa. 
You can tell even if there's no paper in front of him. Rasul ﷺ did not receive papers coming down from the sky that he could recite. The angel ﷺ, Jibreel ﷺ, would reveal the Qur'an on his heart. And he would follow from what was given in his heart. عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ In Surah Al-Shu'ara, the, the Ruh Al-Ameen, Jibreel alayhi salam, put this Qur'an on your heart. Now I want you to understand, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ The way the Messenger will recite the ayat, would become immediately clear to the Ummiyeen, no Ummi speaks like this. This is not from us. He is following something else. He is following the ayat of Allah. He is reading the ayat of Allah. Subhanallah. Allah in the beginning of this ayah called him Ummi. Which means someone who cannot read. And now he tells us he reads the ayat. He follows the ayat. Who gave him his education? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, has educa- Allah chose to educate this human being in the middle of the desert. The Greeks had their philosophy, the Romans had their empire, the Persians had their literature. And in the middle of the desert where they had no huge buildings and no libraries and no universities and no roads, they didn't even have good construction, they had mud homes. They didn't have massive infrastructure and huge you know, civilization, they had nothing, these Arabs had nothing. And in the middle of nothing, Allah Azza wa Jal starts teaching this human being. In the middle of nothing. And even in that there's a lesson. When Allah will teach you, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. When you decide to learn Allah's deen, don't make excuses, I have no resources around me. Allah chose, the, the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal is to bring light in the middle of darkness. Quraysh is in the middle of darkness and Allah Azza wa Jal brings his message, message there sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yatlu alayhi mayatihi. Then he says, wa yuzakihim. So the messenger reads the ayat onto the people. And then he purifies them. Wa yuzakihim. This is number two. First he reads the ayat. Two, he purifies them. Three, wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab. He teaches them the book. Four, Wal hikmah, and he teaches them wisdom. I'll say those four things again. He reads the ayat is number one. He purifies them is number two. He teaches them the book is number three. He teaches them wisdom is number four. Now let me start over again. How do you know? It's, this is going to seem completely unrelated, but pay attention, you'll appreciate it. How do you know in old times, not nowadays, in old times, how do you know that you are near the palace of a king? How do you know? You start seeing soldiers. You start seeing flags. You start seeing huge monuments and statues. Those are all signs that nearby, who is there? A king is there. Maybe you enter into the border and there are soldiers at the border and they've got a huge sign, you are entering a kingdom. You understand? You can tell a king by certain signs. And you see his signs and you can tell, well, I think I'm in this kingdom. If you're back in the day, you're in Egypt and you're walking by and you see a giant pyramid, you're in a kingdom. You understand? You see a massive sphinx, you're in a kingdom. This is clearly the work of a king, you understand? So uh, what I'm trying to say is, a king is known by his signs. A king is known by his what? His signs. Now listen, in the first ayah, Allah gave us four names. Who remembers the four names? What was the first name? Al-Malik, the king. What's the second name? Al-Quddus, which means what? I forgot. You have to remind me. The pure. And the purifier, what's three? Al-Aziz, Al-Aziz which means what? The, the one who has respect and authority, good. What's the fourth one? Al-Hakim, which means what? Okay, in the second ayah, the first ayah was about Allah, the second ayah was about Rasulullah wasallam. First thing Allah says about the Rasul wasallam. He tells people, he reads onto the people about Allah's signs. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ And how is a king known? A king is known by his signs. Allah is Al-Malik. You want to know Al-Malik? You appreciate his 
signs. What is the second thing Rasulullah do? What does he do? He says, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ He purifies them. Wait, he purifies them? The Messenger purifies the people? What was the second name of Allah in the first ayah? Al-Quddus, what does that mean? Oh my God! Allah is the pure, and the Messenger is what? Purifying them. The third thing Allah says about the Messenger وسلم, is that He teaches people the book. He teaches them the book. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْكِتَابِ Now the thing with the book, in old Arabic and even today, the word book is not just used for a book. Book is also used for the law. For not just a book, also for the law or the constitution. In the Qur'an, one of the names of the Sharia is Kitab Allah. Like Allah will give some laws, some ahkam, and He will say, Kitab Allahi alaykum, the book of Allah that is mandated upon you, which means the law of Allah that is mandated upon you. When Allah says, you have to fast, He says, Kutiba alaykum siyam Fasting was not written on you, that's okay translation, Fasting was made the law on you. It is prescribed upon you. It is now legally binding on you. Back in America, when you have a judge, when you have a judge and he wants to throw someone in jail, we say he threw the book at him. The judge threw the book at him. That does not mean that the judge picked up a phone book and threw it at the guy. It means he used the law the full extent of the law against this person. You understand? So the book has to do with what? The law. Where does the law come from? Laws come from the authority. Isn't that true? So the third activity of the messenger is he teaches them the law. And the third name of Allah in the first ayah was that he is the authority. You remember that? Subhanallah. What was the fourth name of Allah in the ayah? Which means what? Al-Hakim means what? Allah says in the second ayah, the Messenger والسلام, the fourth thing he does, he teaches them wisdom. He teaches them wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? It comes from the wise, the fourth name of Allah. There are four names of Allah in the first ayah, and there are four activities of the Messenger in the second ayah, and they are one on top of the other. They're superimposed on each other. This is the perfection of Allah's kalam. This is how Allah speaks. You and I don't speak like this. This is yatlu alayhi ayatihi. You understand? But now I want to take a step further. The real reason I wanted to talk to you about these ayat. In this second ayah of the surah, a great scholar of the Qur'an, Hamiduddin Farahi rahimahullah, in, the, in his tafsir of this surah, he said that the second ayah of this surah is the heart of this surah. If you understand this ayah, you will understand the whole surah. And if you miss this ayah, you will miss the whole surah. That's the second ayah of this surah, which I just recited to you. In this ayah, the messenger does four things. And let me tell you why that's important. These four things are the formula. They are the formula that Allah gave the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to accomplish his mission. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has a mission. Just because you have a mission, does not mean you know how to fulfill it. You don't just need the task, you also need the method, the instructions. This ayah is how does the messenger accomplish his mission. And because this is his method that Allah gave him, from then onwards until today, this is our mission. And this is the way we accomplish our mission. Now let me ask you, or, or tell you a little bit at least, what is the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The mission of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is to take a community that has fallen into corruption. And he has to bring them into the light of iman. يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى nur. That's his job. How is he going to do it? That's the question. He will do it through this process. And because this is a madani ayah, this is a madani ayah, it means this process is good for the Quraysh, for the Meccans, and it's also correct for the Muslims. Even in a Muslim community, is it possible our iman goes down? Is it possible that we don't feel as close to Allah 
in one generation after the next after the next that we're becoming further and further away from Allah? Is it possible we're becoming more materialistic, more ghafil of Allah, that we don't cry in salat anymore, that we don't feel like we feel like reciting Quran much anymore, our du'as have become empty, we just recite some words and say them, we don't even know what they mean, and we don't even care? Does, is that possible? Is that problem possible? When the community, when a Muslim community has that problem, how can they fix it again? How can they get back on track? These are the ayat. These are the ayat. Which means these ayat will be relevant for you and me. Not just as a nation, even as a person. Think, forget about the entire country. Forget about the entire ummah. Just think about yourself. Aren't there days where you have become so far from Allah, that you need to get back and you don't even know how? Where do you begin? I feel so distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's been so long since I cried in a salah. It's been so long since I felt a connection with Him. How do I feel that connection? So many people ask that question. It is in these ayat that the answer lies. Step one, yatlu alayhim ayatihi. That He recites unto them what? His ayat. We have to engage the word of Allah. We have to recite the word of Allah. We have to stop and think about the word of Allah. We have to think about the fact that every time Allah is speaking, He's talking to me. He's talking to me directly. Wallahi, the greatest gift you will ever, ever have in your life is the gift of Allah's speech. Allah chose to speak to you. Allah chose to speak to me in this book. No other religion gives you this kind of direct access to Allah. That Allah is talking to you and me. But some people say, no, no, no. But Allah is only talking to the Prophet wasallam. He's not talking to me. This is not a book for me. This is a book for the ulama, for the scholars. This is just, I just recited with tajweed, but I'm not supposed to think about it. Fihi dhikrukum Allah says. In it, Allah is talking about you. That's literally what He says. In it is your mention. It's about you. First thing you engage this book. First thing we have to do in every Muslim community in the world, and we have to do it constantly, is revive this sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What is that sunnah? Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. Now you tell me. There are millions of us all over the world, in billions even. We get together in Ramadan and we stand and we listen to the Qur'an being recited. But the vast majority of us, the vast majority of us have no idea what just happened. No clue. And I don't blame you. I don't blame you. But I do say, I, I will blame you if you don't care. It is not your fault that you don't know. That's not your fault. Allah gave this messenger, this messenger in a nation that was what? Ummiyin. Being ummi, not knowing the words, not knowing how to read and write is not their fault. That is not their fault. But if a messenger has come to you and he's giving you the ayat, and he's reciting them onto you, and you don't even care to understand, then it's your fault. These are people Allah describes in the Qur'an who listen to the word of Allah, لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا سُمَّا وَعُمْيَانًا They don't fall on these ayat deaf and blind. We in 2014 have to create an entire movement all over the world that within the next 10 years, there will be no Muslim teenager that does not know the meanings of the Qur'an. There will be no 15, 16 year old who does not know what Allah says. He has no idea what's in Surah Al-Baqarah, or in Surah Al-Jathiyah, or in Juz Amma. He does not know. No way. We can do that. It is possible. We can do it within 10 years or even less. But we have to care. We have to actually become part of this effort. And that is not one person's job. Every single member of this ummah, you and I are responsible to educate ourselves and educate our families. Educate our children. They have to learn what this book means. This, came, this book came so we can think about it. Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiyan. La'allakum, la'allakum ta'aqilun. 
We give this in Arabic, we send down an Arabic Quran so you can think, you can understand. Allah keeps saying that to you and me. I gave you this Quran so you can understand, so you can understand, so you can understand. And we say, no, 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 you gave me this Quran so I can learn Tajweed and recite and listen to a CD in my car. That's it. That's the end of it. Tajweed is important. Recitation is important. But those are all secondary. As a matter of fact, you know why Tajweed is important? Tajweed is important so you recite the Quran clearly. And when you recite it clearly, it becomes easier to understand. Why is the Quran memorized? So you repeat yourself. And the more you repeat, the better you understand. Everything that has to do with our relationship with the Qur'an goes back to the fundamental, which is we have to understand this Qur'an. It goes back to understanding this Qur'an. As a matter of fact, when people are drunk, back in the day, our alcohol was not, or wine was not haram yet. And you know the big problem with wine? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. Those of you who have iman, don't come near the prayer. Don't pray, don't come near the salah while you are drunk. Until when? Until you know what you're saying. Until you know what you're saying. One of the major problems with wine in the Quran is somebody will make salah and the problem will be what? They don't know what they're saying. Now, Alhamdulillah, we don't have the wine problem. Alhamdulillah, for the most part, we don't have the wine problem. But we have the other problem, don't we? We don't know what we're saying. We don't know what we're saying. That is an emergency. That is an emergency. We think about you know, physical emergencies. An earthquake is a physical emergency. A war is a physical emergency. But me not understanding the word of Allah when I recite it, that is a spiritual emergency. I have to care about this. And if I am 30, 35 years old, 25 years old, and I never got a chance to learn, I will make sure I don't deprive my children. I will make sure they don't reach my age and say, I wish I knew what the Qur'an meant. I will not let that happen to my kids. I will start learning today, even if I'm 80 years old. Even if I'm 90 years old. Because the month of Qur'an is coming. I, the messenger would recite the ayat onto the people. Now you tell me, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would recite the ayat onto the Quraysh, did the Quraysh understand the Qur'an? Did they understand the Qur'an? Yeah, they did. This is a very big deal. There are stories in the Qur'an where kuffar, non-Muslims, haters of Islam, they heard the ayat of Allah and they started crying. The kafir started crying. Today my problem is, I'm not a kafir alhamdulillah, and I'm listening to the word of Allah and nothing moves. Nothing moves, that's a tragedy. I, the Qur'an got more of a reaction from a kafir back then, than it gets from me today. That's a problem. That's an emergency. Yatlu alayhi mayatihi. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ The second thing the messenger is, this is his formula. You have to make the Qur'an common. The mother is teaching her son. She's teaching her daughter. The, the husband is teaching his wife. The wife is teaching the husband if she knows more. The, the family is becoming a family of the Book of Allah. You know? They're trying to find every opportunity they can to further their understanding of it. They're memorizing it, they're studying its tajweed, they're learning its meaning, they're studying its tafsir. Because this, is, this book is like food for them. Just like every few hours you need food, Allah makes you and me go back and make salah. And the longest part of salah is what? Is qiyam. And in qiyam, what do you recite? You recite Qur'an. How can I not have a direct relationship? He says, well, you him. And when we talk about uh, the messenger purifies them, usually it's not broken up like this, but I'll break it up like this for you guys. There are two parts to it. There are two parts of purification. There's the purification of the mind, and there's the purification of the heart. Once again, there are two kinds of purification. What are the two kinds? Purification of the mind, and purification of the heart. The Qur'an says the messenger purifies them. 
What does that mean? He purifies their mind and he purifies their heart. Now let's understand both of them. Purifying their mind means Allah teaches you how to think. Allah teaches you how to understand reality. Allah makes you smart in the Quran. Allah teaches you how to ask, ask the right questions. How to give the right answers. Allah will teach you, they say this, you say this. Why don't you think about this? Why don't you look at that and reflect on that? Allah is constantly training you how to think. And when you learn how to think properly, your mind is becoming purified. Your mind is becoming purified. We're becoming more intelligent Muslims when we are being purified by the Qur'an and our minds are being purified. What is the second kind of purification? The heart. My heart has jealousy. It has laziness. It has greed. It has temptation. It has lust. It has forgetfulness. It has a lot of diseases. My heart's got a lot of diseases. And if I properly understand the Qur'an and recite it sincerely, it is as though Allah is giving me advice about my problems and I start getting better. My anger doesn't go away, but it starts getting diminished. My greed doesn't go away, but it starts coming under control. You understand? Allah puts it under control. You know Allah Azza wa Jal in the Qur'an, if you recite it with deep, if you properly think about the Qur'an and you recite it, or you listen to its recitation, something will happen to you. Something will happen to you. You're reading the book of Allah anywhere in the Qur'an, anywhere in the Qur'an. You will be, you'll be, you know, we'll finish watching a movie for three hours. And you're driving home. And you're like, should I listen to the radio? And you're changing channels on the radio in the car. And accidentally you put the Qur'an recitation on. Just accidentally. And it says, يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Everything in the skies and the earth is remembering Allah, is doing tasbih. And you just came back from a movie. Were you remembering Allah? No. And you just feel bad. You're like, I should be doing tasbih. Astaghfirullah Rabbi. Your ghafla, your heedlessness is being addressed by every ayah, every ayah. It will cleanse the mind and it will cleanse the heart. Wallahi, there is no text. There is no text in existence. There is no book like the book of Allah that cleanses my mind and cleanses my heart at the same time. There is no such thing. Either you have books about spirituality or you have books about philosophy and thinking and all of this stuff. Allah Azza wa Jal makes those, makes those two things inseparable. He makes them inseparable. And this is the, the gift of Allah to this ummah. You know why? Because the Christians, for example, the Christians emphasize spirituality. You know that, right? They emphasize spirituality. They emphasize the heart. And you know what the Jews emphasized? No pro this is not a concern. This is why Allah says, Qasat qulubuhum. Their hearts became hard. So one nation became overly intellectual, and the other nation became overly spiritual. Allah gave us wa yuzakihim. He purifies their intellect and He purifies their hearts, and He balances both of them. Because if you go one too much or the other too much, a corruption comes into yourself. A corruption settles, settles inside you. Subhanallah. Wa yuzakihim. And if we do this enough, if we recite the Qur'an enough, the Qur'an will start to change how we think. The Qur'an will change the way you think about your money, the way you think about raising your family. The Qur'an will start changing the way you think about spending your time, or what career you're going to choose, or what kind of business you're going to do, or how you will treat your neighbor, or how you will treat your family. It will start affecting you. It'll start cleansing you. And so now, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Then Allah teaches them the book. Then education begins. This is very important people. Please listen to this carefully. I know it's hot. And I know the fans are not enough. I know. I know. It's hot for me. To, I'm melting. <laughs> Literally, this is the best weight loss program I've ever had. Like I was <laughs> lost. You know. But listen. This is important. In Islam, in this, in this formula that was given to Rasulullah the law is number three. 
The law is mentioned as number, he teaches them the law. That's mentioned at number three. What was the first thing? He reads the ayat onto them. What was the second thing? He purifies them. Then he teaches them the law. Let me tell you something about that. When you teach someone, when you teach someone, then they have to be students. They have to be students. Right now you guys, I'm not teaching you anything. I am not. Because you are not what right now? You're just an audience. You're not a student. Not right now. Some of you are sleeping like that guy over there. It's fine. Okay? It's fine. Because you're just, you're an audience. If I was your teacher, it would be a different relationship. I have, I have students back home in Texas. I have students. And those students, when I give a lecture, they cry. But they don't cry because their iman went up. They cry because I'm their teacher. And I destroy them in class. <laughs> if I'm your teacher, every two minutes I will ask you a question. Hey, Abdul Karim, tell me the answer. Fatima, tell me the answer. What is the answer? Why don't you know? Pay attention. A teacher makes sure that the student what? Who understands, learns. And the teacher tests the student. Then the teacher fails the student. Then the teacher retests the student. Then the teacher humiliates the student. Then the student asks the teacher and asks again. Then the teacher answers again. It's a back and forth and back and forth. Is teaching easy? No. Teaching is not easy. Teaching, do you have to have a relationship when you're teaching? Absolutely. And in that relationship, you need two people that are very serious. The teacher is very serious and the student is very serious. But when, the, when Allah said, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ He reads the ayat onto them. He just reads the ayat. Is that a teacher-student relationship? No. He's just reading the ayat. Just like I'm reading the ayat to you right now. And hopefully, as I'm reading these ayat to you, what might happen to some of you? You might start thinking differently about Ramadan. You, you might start, something in your heart might change. But that's not because of me. That is because of the ayat. That's because of the ayat. And now that you become serious, you might decide to go into a class and take a teacher and become serious and start learning. And start learning. But you would never become serious until the ayat were read onto you and they changed something inside you. We expect the entire ummah to learn. We cannot expect them to learn. We just have to give them the ayat first. Then they have to experience a change, some tazkiyah first. That tazkiyah will motivate them to want to what? Learn. By the way, wallahi wallahi, this is the process I went through and so many of you sitting in the audience have gone through. The biggest evidence of this is not the ayah, the biggest evidence of this is your own life. Your own life. You weren't serious at one point. Having you sit in an hour long lecture, hour 20 minute lecture, forget it. Are you kidding me? You have an annoying cousin who keeps sending you Nomar Ali Khan links and you keep erasing them. <laughs> this guy's so annoying. Why does he have so many videos? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and one of you has been dragged by your cousin and you're sitting in the back waiting to leave. I understand totally. Because you're not a student. You know what happens when you make progress though? So you, you, you were not serious before. Allah put something in your hearts. You heard some message, somebody recited the ayat onto you, and something was cleansed inside of you by Allah's permission, so you became serious. You know what happens to people? When they become serious, they think everybody else should become serious too. Everybody else should become like them. And you start getting angry at everybody else. You're walking to the masjid, Astaghfirullah, these people don't even go and make salat. <laughs> it happens or no? It happens. The idea of you going through a process, you forget that you went through a process. When you look at other people, you expect them to get exactly to the same level as yourself or better. You can't. This is the process of Rasulullah wasallam. By the time you get to become serious, you need wisdom. You need wisdom. Because in order to deal with people properly, what do you need? Wisdom. You don't just need knowledge. Sometimes you gain a lot of knowledge, but you have no wisdom in how to deal with people. What does the messenger teach people? He just teaches them the book and says, you're done. That's all you need. You just need the book. Here's the sharia, finished. No. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them wisdom. 
How do you apply this knowledge? How do you share this knowledge? What do you expect from people? That doesn't just require knowledge, that requires wisdom, common sense. So this deen is about being sensitive to other people and what levels they're at. We don't know which stage they're on. We don't know which stage they're on. And it's the problem in the Muslim Ummah today that we expect everybody to know that y- 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 they should learn the kitab and they should live by the kitab because they're Muslim. Just because they're Muslim does not know that the iman is very high. And until the iman goes high, you don't become serious. Our bigger concern has become what is on the outside. Is this woman wearing hijab or not? Does this man have a beard or not? Does he go make salat or not? All of these things are on the outside. But the outside will never be worth anything until you have the inside. The kitab is on the outside. But yatlu alayhi mayatihi wa yuzakkihim. This is on the inside. You have to recite the ayat onto people. Share the word of Allah with people. And you watch, they will change. They will change. I'm telling, I'm say, I'm, I don't mean to share this with you because I want to show off. Wallahi, I do not want to show off. But I want to share a personal story with you. I was just talking to this with, with Brother Harun who was traveling with me and his family also. Maybe about 20 years ago, 20 years ago when I was in high school, I had no Muslim friends. None of my friends were Muslim. My best friend was a Hindu. And this Hindu friend and I, when we finished school, every, like a, every two, three days, we used to go to McDonald's. So my Hindu friend and I are sitting in McDonald's, and he's a, he's a Jain, so he's very strict about his diet. So he would order the Big Mac, but he's a vegetarian. So he would say, I want the Big Mac without the Mac. <laughs> so that's how he would order it. Now, I, at the time, I really didn't care about halal and haram. I didn't care about salah. I didn't care about the Qur'an. I didn't, I didn't know any of this. I didn't care about any of it. But I still knew that I'm a Muslim. So when he used to order the Big Mac without the Mac, I used to say, well, this guy watches his diet. I should watch my diet. Okay, I'll have the fish sandwich. Like I wouldn't order the Big Mac or the chicken sandwich because I don't know if it's halal or not. So I would order the fish sandwich. And we used to sit and talk, and just hang out, talk about stupid things high school kids talk about. You know? But you know what? If one of you walked into the restaurant, and you saw me and my friends sitting there talking about ridiculous things, would you think that guy over there, the guy who looks really stupid, that guy, 20 years from now, he'll be in Malaysia, talking to about 10,000 people, about the Qur'an. Would you think that? This kid, astaghfirullah, a lost cause. Is he even Muslim? Look at him. Look at him. It is so easy for us to underestimate other people. So easy for us. We don't know what Allah will turn someone into. We don't know what Allah will use them for. We don't know. Our job, yatlu alayhim ayatihi. Yuzakihim. For yourself and for others. And for those who become serious, sure, they should learn the book. They should learn wisdom. But not everybody will be a talibul ilm. It's okay. It's okay. It'll happen in time. La tarkabunna tabqan an tabaq. Now Allah Azza wa Jal says this beautiful formula for the entire Muslim Ummah to understand there are some people in your family who are very serious, MashaAllah alayhim. There are some people in your family, they're barely holding on to Islam. They're barely holding on to Islam. And you have to have the wisdom on how to deal with each one. You can't deal with all of them the same way. Some of you have children. Some of your children, MashaAllah, and some of your children, Astaghfirullah. It's the case. It's a reality, isn't it? And so you cannot deal with them the same way. You cannot tell the, ch- the child who is not interested in salah and he's going out late at night, why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be more like this? And you're yelling at him and yelling at him and telling him, Ta'allam al-kitab, Ta'allam, learn the book, take it seriously, memorize, memorize. A lot of times our kids ask, why am I memorizing Qur'an? I don't want to memorize Qur'an. I don't want to memorize it. You're like, Astaghfirullah. You don't want to memorize Qur'an? Let me take you to the shaykh, he'll recite some ayat on you. (laughs) You know, he'll fix you. Because you're not memorizing Qur'an. These kids don't know. 
Because we haven't shared a message with them. You cannot expect them. Wallahi, you cannot expect them. If you turn, if just, I, I know, I want to talk to you about just that, you know that ayah I kept thinking about? I haven't gotten to that ayah yet. But I just want to leave you with one thing with this ayah. At least one thing with this ayah. And that is that with today, there's a really important need of the ummah. We have to make sure that people love this deen. And they love, and they find this deen beautiful. That when, they, when they, people think of something that they love, they think of Islam. And when they think of something beautiful, they think of the Qur'an, they think of the sunnah of the Messenger wasallam. Right now, that is not the case. Even for Muslims, when you ask them about the deen, they don't think of something they love. They think of something they're scared of. They think of something that's very harsh. They don't think of the Qur'an as something they love. They think of something, the Qur'an as something that is just telling them that they're really bad and they're probably going to go to hell anyway. That's the attitude people have developed. We've done this to the Book of Allah. The Book of Allah is far more beautiful. And we've done an ugly job of presenting it. We messed up. We messed up and an entire generation of young people is thinking, you know, when I read the Qur'an, all I think of is, maybe I'm a munafiq and I'm going to Jahannam. That's it. Subhanallah. This book came to give all of humanity hope. And today Muslims don't even find hope in it. That's a tragedy. That's a serious tragedy. Now this ayah, the Rasul ﷺ was given this mission to cleanse and fix Makkah. Right? يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِن كَانُوا مِن قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Even though they were far, clear, clearly lost. Clearly lost. In other words, if you and I saw the Quraysh, we would say these people are a lost cause. If these were patients, we would say, you can forget it, this is terminally ill. No hope for these people. You, anybody would say these people are hopeless. There is no chance they will get better. And yet Allah sent His Messenger to people who the whole world thought they were hopeless. And He turned them around because of this formula. What am I trying to tell you? I don't say about the youth of the ummah today, even if the youth are doing drugs, and they're drinking alcohol, and they're dating, and there are so many converting to Christianity, and there's so many leaving the religion. All of these problems are happening in the Muslim world. But I don't look at the Muslim ummah and say they're hopeless. I don't say that. If Allah can say Quraysh has hope, if Quraysh has hope, and this formula can work with Quraysh, then I believe in this book. I believe this book can tra transform any society, any community. We just have to believe in the formula. We have to believe in the method. Now Allah says in this beautiful surah, this is the ayah I kept thinking about, Wallahi. وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ Allah says, these are the Quraysh, right? The Quraysh are Arabs. And the people in Medina, the people of Yathrib are also Arabs. And they are the ones that the Prophet is working on, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now in this ayah, Allah says, there are akharina minhum. There are other people other than these people. There are other nations, other races, other ethnicities, other regions of the world, other continents, other countries that are not Arab. Lama yalhaqu bihim. They have not joined them yet. Allah did not say, they have not joined them. He said, they have not joined them yet. Yet. The Malays haven't joined the Ummah yet. The Indians haven't joined the Ummah yet. The Africans haven't joined the Ummah yet. The Turks haven't joined the Ummah yet. The Uyghurs haven't joined the Ummah yet. The Europeans haven't joined the Ummah yet. Because the ayat are coming in Medina. None of that has happened. Yet, we, we, most of you that are sitting here that are not Arab, are talked about in this ayah. We're talked about in this ayah. وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ They are other than the Arabs. They haven't joined them yet. When you fly into Malaysia, and you think, of, I think about the fact, how far away from the Arab land is this place? And it's islands that are way out into the sea. And Islam reached over there. Who would think Islam would get all the way into these remote islands and people would be saying, La ilaha illallah. 
Wallahi, I almost cried. We were in Terengganu, I was in the hotel room, I look in the table next to my bed, and there's a copy of the Qur'an. I live in the United States. Every time you pull out the desk, there's a copy of the Bible. I see a copy of the Qur'an, I almost start crying, man. وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ We don't realize, you and I are the fulfillment of Allah's promise in this ayah. You and I are saying, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Because Allah made that promise to His Messenger wasallam. And you and I are only, only people of لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ For no other reason that somebody before us understood this formula. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Somebody who came before us, who understood that when you go to these lands, you will recite the book of Allah, and Allah will purify people who have any goodness in them, then you can teach them the book and the wisdom, and they will come flock into this deen. They will flock into this deen. And that's us. You know what the tragedy though is? When you join the summa, you have to repeat. The same way our ancestors came into Islam, my ancestors were Hindus. Three, four, five, I, I asked my grandfather, it's five generations of Muslims. My, my family is Muslim for five generations, before that they're Hindus. Before they're there, there are all kinds of idol worship in my family. Somebody was given da'wah. Some, some young man who was a Hindu took shahada and decided he will change his life. But he only took shahada because somebody gave him a chance. Somebody spoke to him about Allah's word. Somebody showed him the beauty of Islam. He looked at a Muslim and he saw an honest person. You know, he saw a good sincere friend who was willing to share the word of Allah with him. This is the month of the Qur'an, Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. The same Qur'an that made our ancestors say, La ilaha illallah. The same Qur'an, the gift of which you and I, we, you, we don't earn La ilaha illallah. We didn't pay for it. It was given to us by Allah Azza wa Jal as a result of this promise. وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ Are the Muslims the majority of the planet? Are we the majority? No, we're the minority. Muslims are a minority. We're a significant minority, but we're still the minority, a minority religion on the planet. We're maybe a fifth of the world. That means that Allah Azza wa Jal of the entire population of human beings decided that He will give you this gift and He will give me this gift. But this gift isn't free. It comes with a responsibility. You don't receive this gift of Allah's book, this final message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This Qur'an, and you don't even care. There are so many other people that could have been picked. You were picked. You were picked. You know, you, you didn't deserve it. It was a gift from Allah. Which is why in the next ayah, and I conclude with this ayah, ذَٰلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ That is the favor of Allah. He gives it to whoever He wants. The La ilaha illallah that I say, that you say, is a gift of Allah. It is a favor of Allah. He gave it to you and me. Wallahu dhul fadl al azim. And Allah is the possessor of great favor. You know what that means? That Allah's favor did not end with you. Now it's time for you to take Allah's gift and give it to others. Give it to your family. Give it to Muslims and give it to non Muslims. The Muslims today are far from Qur'an, we have to bring them back. If you're far from the Qur'an, you have to make your way back. We have to develop this, and this is the month to do it. If there's one month where you can hit restart, all the mistakes of your past, forget about what happened. Forget about what you did this last year. Forget about what you did your whole life. This is the time to start all over again. It's just me and the word of Allah because I recognize Allah Azza wa Jal made me among those who the Sahaba made dua for. Who Sahaba made dua for. How do I know that? The Sahaba are listening to these ayat. Uh, there are not that many of them. There are not that many of them. And Allah tells them there are other people coming. There are other people that haven't joined you yet. Ya Allah, bring them soon. Ya Allah, protect those people that haven't joined them yet, joined us yet, yet, us yet. Subhanallah. The Sahaba are waiting for us. They're waiting for us. Subhanallah. That's this Ummah. That is this Ummah. 
So I'm sincerely making dua for myself and for all of you that this month, this coming month, is, it's always been a month where I pray, it's always been a month where I recite Qur'an, but this time, I'm not only going to pray, and I'm not only going to recite the Qur'an, this month I'm going to try to understand this Qur'an. I'm going to learn something more about this Qur'an. I'm going to share what I learn with my family. I'm going to talk to them about this Qur'an. I'm going to try to develop a new love for this Qur'an, and share that love with my loved ones, for this Qur'an, and Allah will put barakah in all of your efforts because you're doing it in the month of the Qur'an. In the month of the Qur'an. As I leave you, I'll tell you one last thing about the ayah of Ramadan again. The ayah is, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an hudan lil-nas. You know the Nahawiyun, the grammarians, they debated about this ayah. They said this ayah could have two meanings. One meaning is hudan lin nas is actually about the Qur'an. The Qur'an is guidance for all of humanity. The other is shahru ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an is murakkab naqis. I'm sorry, I'm getting technical. I'll simplify in a second. And hudan lin nas is actually the khabar. Which means the month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an came down, the month itself is guidance for humanity. The Qur'an is guidance for humanity and the month is guidance for humanity. What that means is, if you're looking for guidance, if you're looking for change, and you're looking to share this beautiful message with loved ones and friends who are not even Muslim, this is the month to share it in. Because the month itself is guidance for humanity. The month itself is guidance for humanity. May Allah Azza wa give all of us the rizq of Ramadan. May Allah accept all of our ibadat and all of our worship and all of our fasting. May Allah make the fasting easy for every single one of us. May Allah Azza wa make this month a month in which we increase our love for the Qur'an and are able to increase the love for our entirely for the Book of Allah. May Allah make this month a month in which we have the courage and the correct words and the wisdom to be able to share something about the ayat of the Qur'an with our non-Muslim friends, and even with our Muslim family that has become far from the deen. That may Allah soften their hearts in this month, and may Allah make us a means for get, getting the word of Allah to them. May Allah Azza wa Jal include all of us among those who earn the shafa'a of His beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah Azza wa Jal overlook all of our mistakes. I, 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 as I leave you, I just want to just share a personal feeling with you. As I go, this is not just my feeling, it's also the feeling of my colleagues. I, you know, I traveled a lot, but I traveled to the Muslim world very little. And so when I travel to this wonderful place, when I travel to Malaysia every time, I feel this new love for the Ummah. You guys don't even know what you have. You don't even know what you have. When you're just driving down the street and you see a giant masjid, do you just see a masjid in the middle of the street? Just You don't know. That's not, that's not something you should take for granted. You know, if Allah did not want this to happen, that would have been a giant temple. There would have been a giant statue inside. And you would have been, and I would have been worshipping inside that temple. But Allah decided, Allah decided that we should be blessed with Islam. That we should be given this truth. You know? So we should be grateful for what we have. I, I just get this, this, this ur, like surging love for the Muslims here. SubhanAllah. May Allah protect you people. May Allah protect you and your families. And may Allah make you an example of how a Muslim community can progress and be modern and be technologically savvy and economically strong and at the same time hold on to every single principle of their deen. And they can live in this dunya without compromising anything from their deen. May Allah make you an example for that, not just for you know, the rest of the ummah, but for all of humanity. Barakallahu li walakum, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.